Hello and welcome to our third episode of The Writing Vikings. I'm Lizzie and this is Vandela. And Hello. today we're going to talk to you a bit about our experience of the medieval week in Visby. Yeah. Just, yeah. I've been waiting to do this podcast actually for a while because it was fun uh, being there and the fact that we managed to be there at the same time was um, was just a, j- just fun. So we have a few things on our agenda. Do we want to... Do we want to start then with our sort of writing updates? There's something new that we thought we should bring on, bring into the podcast. Yeah, absolutely. So we just, both of us are at an exciting point where we're both starting on new projects at the moment. And we just wanted to share a little bit of that process with you. Would you like to start with yours? I think yours is super fascinating. <laughs> oh, uh, okay. Um, so um, I've just finished proofreading. Um, my the whip that I have been working on my my Viking fantasy that I've worked on for years so I am moving on to a completely different project which was actually kind of given to me on a silver platter kind of thing by one of our um writing friends um Catherine who is sort of the founder of the our morning zoom meetings and also the um the Stockholm Writers' Festival. And she stumbled upon something in her research for a book and thought that someone else should write a book about this specific piece of research. And um, I just got so interested in this. And I don't want to spoil what it is because I think, um, oh my God, obviously I've not thought of a pitch uh, about this thing. Basically, uh, we're thinking end of 30 years war, so 1648 at the Swedish Royal Court with um, quite an extensive or very, uh, I want to say special, uh, magic system. So there is this sort of um, um, a magic society. Um, so it, basically it's fantasy. There's magic. But as usual, as usual, there is history because I'm a history nerd. So we're, we're doing historical fantasy. Again, uh, there might be a heist. I don't know. I totally did not pitch that uh, in the correct way, but that is that is what it is. And here's a good thing to know: like clear, like well thought out pitches, they don't come until like the end of a project, and most of the time, it's like I know I have an image in my head of what it is that I'm doing, but trying to explain it to anyone else that is always a that is literally step. what it is. It is <laughs> images and a few characters and some elements, a, a huge magic system which. I've actually managed to pin down. So that's kind of done. But yeah, so it's this month I am researching and world building. Next month in October, that is, I'm doing Preptober. So I'm trying to plot my book. And then in November, I'm actually going to try drafting it out, at least a rough a rough draft um, and actually approaching NaNoWriMo. I want to say correctly for the first time because it's the perfect time for me to do NaNoWriMo for this project this year whereas NaNoWriMo has always come around when it's been like revisions or editing like it's never been NaNoWriMo has never suited me time-wise but it is it has this year and the fun thing is that Lizzie is going to do it with me so why don't you go ahead and tell us about your NaNoWriMo project yeah yeah it's super fun because like we're both kind of using the same time scale frame time scale frame I don't know if that was even a logical uh, phrase I think people but... know what we mean so <laughs> I think it's acceptable uh, yeah so like we're both doing a lot of world building at the moment and then I'm also going to be plotting in the next month my uh project is moving away from like I very much write in more traditional fantasy styles um I'm now moving into something that's a bit more like dystopian and futuristic post-apocalyptic however I'm starting to try to weave in some magic there as well because there's certain things I cannot explain um why it's working unless I have a magic system there so I just need to come up with something fun there but mine has a bit more of like um a serious tone to it again I'm not going into too many details but I can talk about like my inspiration from it came from um when I was working for two months in Fiji and we were working on a bunch of like tiny islands and even though these islands were like the furthest away that we could possibly be from like what I'm used to living in and cities, like we're out in the middle of the ocean, like 
there's literally the closest like mainland civilization you have to take a boat ride for like three hours across the sea to get there which was an adventure in itself uh, but that is a story for another time <laughs> um and like even though it's so far out every time we went to a beach and we were going to film something on the beach we had to like go and remove bits of plastic and trash that had washed up onto that beach and it's like I mean you hear stories about how like the there is so much plastic in the ocean and like things washed up on rivers and things but it's a very different experience when you actually see that for yourself in somewhere that looks like it's completely idyllic and pristine and there's not mm. even people living here um and then you actually see that for yourself and you have to kind of hide it so that other people don't see that as well um cuz obviously we were taking pictures that will be shown publicly um mm. So that was a very, very weird experience. So we found like shoes, um, back bus buskets, <laughs> um, buckets. Um, so mm. shoes, buckets, even like a doorbell, uh, like toothbrushes and things. So basically, I am ha creating like a world that is kind of loosely inspired by this in a way that is like a duality between. It is reflecting like the worst case scenario for what happens for our world. But I'm also mm. having to like add fantasy tweaks from it, because if I make it the worst case scenario, then there is no story because there is nothing alive anymore. Mm. Uh, so that's like an odd balance. So I'm doing a lot of research trying to figure out where the balance between like reality and realism is and where kind of like magic and like the unexplainable things are at the moment. So I'm trying to yeah because I want to like take a serious approach to this that actually acknowledges the real situation and maybe hopefully has some kind of impact <laughs> uh it's always mm. hard to know if we can use it but also like I don't want it to be like a serious serious story at the same time so it's a fun story that has uh like serious background to it and finding that balance is uh it's a process yeah no I can imagine it is, I think it's in general, it's hard to find a balance between what is real and then fantasy magic. It, it's like, I'm a huge fan of historical fantasy and I balancing sort of like, what are you allowed to do while still keeping, but while still being true to fantasy or, or, or sorry, history. Um, and I think sometimes you need to make it really clear that you're writing fantasy so that people don't necessarily like question you They're like, well, that that's not realistic. That wouldn't have happened because in this time period, and I'm like, no, but did I mention that there is magic, like magic I made up to suit this time period? Like it's fantasy. <laughs> it's so, um, but I do get it. Like I'm um, trying to keep a, a serious tone to it as well to not just make it entertainment. I'm, I've am i never been in that situation. None of my books are meant to spread a message in that kind of way. But I mm -hmm. think it's um, it will be very interesting to see how you approach mm -hmm. and tackle this this thing. Because I think it, this story has some, mm -hmm. um, it's, it sounds promising. I'm, I'm excited to potentially get to read it. Yeah. I mean, I don't even know how much of a message it in itself is like going to be intended to spread because I think, that part has come along afterwards because I started I started like writing and planning things based on the idea for the story that I mm. have but the more that I read about it I'm like I don't feel like I can write about this without trying oh, to yeah you mentioned that in some way mm. um which is interesting I had another follow-up point but it's completely gone out of my head now so <laughs> uh it will probably get back to you you know way after we've finish this podcast but you know yeah. save it save it for another podcast um all right so basically we're both doing NaNoWriMo this year we're both plotting or prepping uh, in October and we're both world building at the moment and doing research so that's super exciting sort of having the same time frame um and I think um uh, we can both uh, maybe we'll do a a NaNo episode maybe after NaNo to sort of uh reflect on how it went or how this mm. these projects how they're doing sort of you know in what will it be two two and a half months mm. kind of yeah because it's the, the middle of September yeah. now the experience yeah. and see if uh we actually managed to do it like my track record with NaNoWriMo sucks yeah <laughs> just for mm. the record 
<laughs> same, same. But I, it, yeah. I, I think it will be exciting to try for once to actually go in the, you know, with the intention of writing something from from scratch. So um, yeah, should we move on and talk Absolutely. about uh, Medeltidsveckan or the medieval week? It feels so weird to call it the medieval week, but I know. <laughs> But it is what it is. It literally is. Medeltid is medieval and veckan is week. Week, yeah. yeah. So it's, um, should we, a, a quick, I guess, I want to say definition, but just explanation of what it, or description of what it is. So uh, on Gotland, which is an island uh, in Sweden, or just like on the coast of Sweden, um, Gotland is quite famous for having a lot of um, medieval history, kind of just you know, it's, I want to say the med- medieval times are a big part of like Gotland culture somehow, but every week in August, or every week, one week in August every year, they have what's called uh, the medieval week, which is um, a week, it's kind of like a festival, I want to say, uh, where there's medieval markets, pe- like people sell medieval crafts and just food and stuff and books, and it's just yeah um huge markets and then they also have like um tournaments or plays and performances and concerts and they have lectures and talks and workshops uh, as you can learn different um medieval skills in workshops but you can also listen to uh, people talk about anything medieval in different Mm -hmm. lectures and so on um so it's really a huge um thing for just nerds of medieval stuff yeah but this year it had the um the theme uh fantasy which was a little I don't know what what did you think about that keep in mind none of us neither of us have actually been to Medeltidsveckan previously this was our first year both of us um but yeah your thoughts on the fantasy theme yep my thoughts was that I, I felt like the name was there more to lure like another set of the audience that they've noticed has like an interest in the medieval week because mm. I was it's not oh like the like those two kind of camps you have reenactors and then you have larpers and I, on its face value like a medieval week with a focus on um like history and markets and things that feels clearly more tailored towards reenactors who are people that are actually clothing up inspired by historical periods and Mm. it's more of an educational background but I think they wanted to add an angle that was more towards LARPers because there's a bit of a crossover that if you like dressing up in clothes then and pretending to be different characters there's a bit of a crossover. Do you Um, want to explain what a LARP is? Is, oh, yeah. and maybe but, how it's different from like cosplay because I think there's a lot of different terms that that might yeah there's a lot of people who aren't involved yeah in this actually kind of and thing. also I'm not sure I can put a clear boundary between cosplay and LARPing because I don't know that much about that side of things um I know yeah yeah I don't know if you have a clearer well cosplay is yeah. specifically dressing up as characters isn't it from fictional mm-hmm words words worlds so you've got like people who cosplay as literally like marvel characters anything a lot of um comic con exact exact for example uh, a lot of people go cosplaying for stuff like that mm. um histor- historical reenactment really is not cosplaying i, I don't think no. um but then i suppose to yeah but I think, like, I'd say historical reenactment is not cosplaying, but I think it can attract cosplayers to it. Yes, and I so think a lot of times used... people are confused. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which shows in the clothing that people wear during the medieval week, which is a whole lot, yeah. which we can talk about later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so basically, I think I felt like this was their attempt to draw the side the other side or make Mm -hmm. them feel more like we have a place here so they had a lot of like um they had some events that were focused on role playing so like tabletop rpgs so there were yeah there was a lot of uh, role playing stuff which i think Mm -hmm. is pretty exciting actually 
from a writing perspective. Um, sorry, continue. Yeah. Yeah, so they had the, yeah, so role-playing, and then they had a cosplay parade also, but I didn't see that or had nothing to do with that. I missed that because I left. I was only there for half mm. a week, so I missed that, actually. Mm. But yeah. Yeah, but, like, my, my overall feeling was that, like, it was a little bit added onto the side to attract those viewers, but I don't feel like it really stood out as like here is a solid theme we're having or at least it's not something that I noticed as a solid theme whilst being around like if I hadn't read that there was a fantasy theme I might not even have thought about it except that there were a lot there were some elves there were a lot of elves um, and there were a lot of pirates but then the pirates apparently show up every year and they're just an outside kind of thing we found out later yeah. That the pirates come every year and they just have their own kind of thing on the side. Yeah. yeah. So this this was a funny thing that we like both of us on the first day were like, why are there so many pirates walking around? Like, what mm. are they doing? Like, like a lot of pirates. <laughs> like, I'm not I'm not even joking. Like a lot of pirates. Yeah. And not it's the like, Viking kind. Like, just, you know, actual, like classic. like pirates with like the hats that are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't remember the official term for them um so we're just like I mean I mean our pirates fantasy they're not really medieval like where do you fall here mm. um but then like as the week progressed I started to notice like groups of these pirates gathering around um and I was kind of like okay the pirates seem to be doing something and then like I think on the day before I left like I walked out of one of the gates like there's these massive like medieval walls surrounding the whole town so it's like becomes very imposing and Bis- like very the beast the, the i want to say the capital of gotland but that doesn't gotland is not its own country it's part mm. of sweden but but the sort of the big city this mm. is surrounded by a wall uh with sort of like towers here and there uh it's a beautiful wall and it is a medieval mm. wall uh so it's um um quite a nice place to have this week but yeah continue yeah so basically I walked out of this gate and then turned around and noticed there was a lot of pirates there and like one of them was like talking into a microphone and on the wall there was this big banner that said in Swedish it said uh there is nothing to see here and then like I was with a friend that had been to the medieval week like many many years and I asked them like wait so are the pirates an actual thing and apparently the pirates are like an unofficial subgroup that meet outside the walls quite a lot during the medieval week and have their own like unofficial schedule <laughs> so <laughs> so bizarre it's like a subculture within a subculture yeah <laughs> but we um, heard them play some music didn't we in the park oh were yeah there was a group of pirates it was really nice yeah yeah so um but super excited it does actually say on the website that you don't have to dress up in medieval clothes you can you're actually welcome to dress up in in any historical clothing like it you know that there are no there are no rules and also you don't have to be dressed up at all the first day I went I wasn't actually dressed up and then the other two days I went I was dressed up so you can say the amount of like people that were wearing like really like thought out well-made costumes and then had a pair of trainers underneath which just broke the whole image like I am so sorry but (laughs) but the worst is that my shoes are not authentic either um, but you also made of have... linen, at least. Yeah. Or they look uh, like linen. Yeah, and it's a, it, they're not dyed in the, you know, they're not hot pink or lime green. So mm. that was a bit jarring. But then I, we're not hating on people no. who at least made an attempt to dress up. Yeah. That's <laughs> not the purpose of this. But you, you, you become observant of what people wear because you're so into historical reenactment and and dressing up. And I love um sewing and making my own clothes and clothes and I love textiles so I just l- really like observing what people mm. wear and to what you know um you can tell if people have made their own stuff or if it's all if it's bought or you know made with a sewing machine or whatever and there were some really really nice um I don't want to say costumes because I don't really regard it as costumes when you're no. doing historical reenactment it's more like just your your clothing your clothes you yeah um so there were some really nice uh, outfits shall we say yeah some really outfits, nice outfits word. but then some people you've got the really plasticky shiny um cheap kind of um textiles that are sort of like hot pink or deep purple and I'm just like uh 
yeah. <laughs> like I get frustrated <laughs> I don't know I I just find it um I'm happy they're having a good time yeah and uh, it's just you just sit there and you're like historically incorrect that's historically yeah. incorrect and it's like it yeah. shouldn't even and matter it, because there was a fantasy theme exactly. so really anything's possible but yeah yeah and I think like we're extra sensitive to it because we went straight from having been in the, the Viking village which we're going to talk week. about in a later yeah. episode in more detail we were that I was there for a month and you were there for like a week before yeah. going straight and there we like we really try to be as authentic as we can and then suddenly yeah. going to, and people uh, are genuinely sat by the fires sewing their own stuff or needle binding mm. or tablet weaving like people are really putting effort into their to their outfits and and so on and then you show up at this huge festival and some people are just dressed in amazing outfits and other people mm. just on yeah I feel like those people are dressing up as opposed to those who are just yeah, mm. and I think mm. there's a lot of people that go just kind of for the social aspects of the yeah, clothes for which themselves. Is aren't totally actually cool. that important. They're like, we just want something that feels historical, and then we're just yeah. gonna hang out and drink beer. <laughs> but I will, I will say that some families must have thought much a lot about it because there were some kids that wore really authentic clothes. Like, I am happy to overlook kids that are dressing up as princesses and knights and whatever. Like, totally. But there were some kids with really authentic stuff, like as clearly their parents are into it or the whole family because you know even in our viking village the whole families like three generations like you know will will live there for a month so some kids are sort of they haven't really had a choice they're into historical reenactment because that's what they their family does and it was um it's quite nice seeing all these kids running around with you know authentic um clothes and it's just yeah it's quite quite cute actually (laughs) (laughs) I think it might also be nice to make a note because I think there's a bunch of errors that get made in clothing and it's made by accident from people that genuinely Mm. do want to have something that feels historical so I feel like it might be worth making a little comment here for people that are maybe thinking about creating their own clothes or writers that are thinking about writing historically and want their clothing to be accurate and I think a big point that might be worth just mentioning is the color of linen uh because it's really got to me (laughs) yeah in historical markets you will see linen being sold in all colors all ranges of colors from bright pink to purple to reds blues greens however all of those colors are artificial they're just not and it doesn't even matter if someone will say that that plant died because it just does not if you plant dye stuff you will get um you'll get sort of autumnal or foresty colors like uh, yellow green orange brown you can get red and purple and blue if you're really fucking rich like don't get me wrong you can get indigo and you can get like you can plant dye clothes and I'm not talking about linen specifically now I'm talking in general um you can get blue stuff but like you need money to do that and so I think a lot of people did come across then as really rich and not an issue like if you want to do a circle reenactment and you want to dress up like why not dress up as the richest fucking king in the world like I, I totally get it excuse my swearing <laughs> um but when it comes to linen linen is not an uh animalistic uh fabric it's a uh, it doesn't have like natural proteins like wool does for example so it doesn't pick up the pigment uh very easily or at all really also linen is super um i want to say like glossy or slippery like if you cut into linen you will want to sew that those two pieces together straight away uh because it just splits like if it's woven which it will be it the the threads just they they yeah they just separate really easily um and so it's super, it's durable, but it, once you cut into it or you get caught and you rip it or something, it just doesn't. And that slippery sort of quality of linen makes it really hard for pigment to latch onto it. Um, so yeah, you just don't, get, I think linen naturally comes in like three different colors. One is like kind of off-white, one, one is more like beige 
and one is like the lightest, the lightest, lightest blue, which is also quite rare. And I wouldn't even really consider it blue. So if you've got hot pink linen on you or even pale blue, I would just be like, nah, even if it was yellow, I'd question it. Unfortunately, because it's just also keep in mind, linen is what you would keep closest to your body. So no one is going to see it that as much as they would see the wall that you would wear over it. So why would you waste time, energy and money on dyeing the linen? I don't know. Do you have anything to add? I totally took over there and <laughs> gave my little lecture on linen dyes or, or pigments and whatnot. No, it was super, it was super good. Um, so yeah, it's just worth knowing that, yeah, if you have a color, fine, but be aware of that you're, it's not historically accurate. And I mean, it's happened to like all of us. I mean, I've definitely, I found like this green linen dress, like in a secondhand mm. store and I was like, oh, I can just redo the seams. And then I have a dress. And this was when I found out about it because I bought the dress and then like someone in the village was just like, nah. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. Uh, okay and then I put the dress to the side and never did anything with it unfortunately I, and yeah yeah at least I hadn't actually bought fresh linen and started sewing on it <laughs> yeah and it's actually I spoke to one of the one of our friends in the in the village who wears linen trousers and he wears dark ones like the black or like dark gray um mm -hmm. And I, we were speaking, we were speaking with someone else and I gave this little lecture about linen and he just looked down at, a at his trousers and he was like I guess these are historically incorrect then. And the other person was just like, yeah, you can't wear those anymore. And I remember because he showed up at the at the medieval week with us and he was actually on the on the lookout for new fabric. I did not force him to change trousers or, or you know, um, find new fabric um, for a new pair of trousers. But it's, it's just so easy to not know. And like, it's hard to find this kind of information as well. Like, I researched clothes for my book, Viking Clothes, and I still did not get everything right. And then I went to the village and I learned loads about clothes and Viking attire and fashion. And I've actually paid so much more attention to uh, the details on clothes in my book since. So, yeah, that's how historical reenactment can be tied into your writing, everyone. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very long about fashion. Yeah, sorry. No, um, no, but no, it's good. It's good. We're just looping in all the threads. Mm. Yeah. But do you have anything else you would like to add about the medieval week? Um. Oh, the, we've got so much more to go through. Yeah. Probably. Uh, it's just figuring out where to start. How about we talk a little bit? Because we both went to different events. We went to some events together, and then some mm -hmm. events we went to separately. Yeah. Uh, for me, I would say one of the standout things was in the. There were a lot of like scheduled lectures that you had to that were ticketed that you had to buy tickets for to go yeah. and listen to them. However, we went to one lecture that was actually for free in the market. So as long as you had a pass for the medieval week, you would be able to go and listen to this. And by hands down, like that was definitely the best. That was the best one. Best talk. Uh, it was a man named Daniel Serra, who is an archaeologist, I think, who specializes in experimental archaeology concerning Viking Age food. Such an interesting talk. We found this one just by accident, kind of a little bit. I don't know. You found it. And then someone else actually recommended it. And we were like, oh, yeah, we're going there now. And um, we just saw loads of people like trying to find this place because it didn't have a specific place or venue. And then he was just sort of sat behind a few tents in this sort of little patch of on this patch of grass, just going like, I think we'll hold it here because like, and it was it was so relaxed and nice. And yeah, do you want to go over what he spoke about? Yeah. So basically, he I think originally the talk was only supposed to be 45 minutes, but he spoke for two hours. So that shows like how passionate and yeah. thorough he is about this. So he basically broke down like all the different major food groups that you might have questions about and went through them one by one. So he went through like uh, what kind of vegetables were there in the Viking Age? What kind of meats would people eat or not eat? Um, as is true, different should grains. We, should we should should we tell them that Vikings did not eat a lot of meat? People yes, hate we this. Should. 
as soon as you ask people, what did you think Vikings ate? And they're like, meat. And you're like, hate to break it to you, but no. <laughs> yeah, so the thing about meat is that if you have an animal on your, like, your farm or somewhere it is way 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 more profitable to keep that animal and use the milk the cheese the eggs whatever extra produce you can get from them it you that will provide you with food throughout the whole winter and if uh, you've got sheep you've got the wool as well exactly and these things will keep you with food and you can also trade them with other people who don't necessarily have those produce. So basically, it's it's way more profitable to keep your animals than to kill them and eat them. So the only times you might kill an animal is if you are rich and you want to demonstrate your wealth because you're making a statement by, look at me, I killed uh, I killed the the whatever animal it was, the, sh the sheep or the pig or... Ow. Yeah, the cow, whatever. Um, whatever we have. I, the, I have the money to do that because I'm not going to starve if I do this. So it's a massive statement. And I think the like the biggest statement you can make is to eat horse meat. So you would kill a horse because it's like horses are very, very valuable. So you would do this like as like um, a big feast to make a statement or during rituals that require a sacrifice. Fun fact. Yeah. I had a piece of meat in my book, cut that piece of meat out mm. and put something else in it instead. Like I just swapped it for other food because uh, even though it was a feast and it was a, a sort of a rich gathering of nobles, I was just like still not big of a feast or a celebration to to um, uh, to serve meat, basically. So I swapped it out for something else. Yeah. So basically, the biggest bulk of your diet, 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 I was mixing up the words dairy and diet in the same word, and it became diet. <laughs> so the biggest part of your diet is going to be grains, quite often, most commonly barley, I think, in this area in particular. So in the kind of north, mid part of Sweden, um, and vegetables, basically, beans, peas. Yeah, yeah. A, a bit of fish. Yeah, because uh, fish we did would fish. have been very important. Like if you're living yeah. by lakes and seas, which a massive proportion of Scandinavia is by yeah. lakes and seas. So fish would have been a big thing. Also want to point out that although grains were a huge like part of the diet, um, that does not translate to bread. Bread would have been something for, again, nobles or rich people because it takes ages to make flour like grains to flour like you'd have to it just it would have taken way too long so there are finds of bread but they he compared it to sort of like clay cakes what it was hard to actually identify it as bread um so what would you make out of grains you'd make porridge more likely and it wouldn't be the kind of smooth kind of oatmeal porridge that you would eat today it would be grainy and much um it wouldn't be as, as smooth, basically. It takes so much time to grind the grains down into mm -hmm. flour. flour. Oh. And I think he said that it would take a whole day of grinding to get enough flour because they didn't have, um, they had a simpler kind of grinding technique. Mm -hmm. That I think he said it would take an entire day of grinding to get enough flour to make a piece of bread this big. I You just would not waste the time. Uh, um, For those of you listening and not watching because Lizzie just demonstrated with her hands the the shape or the size you just made with your hands would be compared to maybe like a coaster yeah that's a like a person. like a coaster for a for a cup or like um that you'd get at a bar literally that is the size I think mm. um of, of of a piece of bread that would be and the bread wouldn't be like a, a fluffy kind of bread it'd be more like a a flatbread kind of thing so it would be about maybe half a centimeter thick mm. so yeah um but in any case it was a very fascinating lecture and I learned an amazing amount from it so yeah. I can definitely recommend if you have an interest in historical food specifically viking age food so look up this uh guy his name again was Daniel Serra and we will we will link him exactly the, and he has, a, he has a cookbook right a cookbook 
Yeah. Yeah. We'll we'll link that in the show notes because he was uh, I've not looked him up since, but he was very knowledgeable. Like he knew a lot of stuff, and I he knew the answers to all the questions people had, and people had a lot of questions, and he really went through sort of protein and then carbs and he went through vegetables and then he went through sweeteners and he went through what I thought was really interesting is that berries I would have thought sort of berries and fruits and nuts would have sort of served as sort of dessert at the time but actually berries were only really picked by slaves or thrall, thralls because um it would again take too much time so it would be a tedious task that was reserved to basically to, to, to slaves because why would you spend time picking berries and so they didn't really eat berries no they, he also had a theory that um I, he said like this isn't something that's proven but it's his his own theory that the vikings didn't there's not really evidence for the vikings go out and foraging so mm. mushrooms like there's a exactly, lot of yeah. mushrooms that grow wild in the forest here in sweden mm. and like we go out and pick them <laughs> they're super tasty but there's no evidence for the vikings doing that and his theory was that in the period just before the Viking Age, there was a massive famine. Oh, yeah. And during this time, people would have been forced to go out and forage to pick, yeah, to pick berries, to pick uh, mushrooms and just anything that you could find that you could eat. So when people started to gain more wealth again after the famine period, those sort of foods might have had a stigma attached to them so that it's like, like a taboo. Exactly. So it's like we don't eat those because we have enough money to not need to eat those things. Which is so petty because it's like tasty and nutritious, but you know, whatever. Yeah, well, people don't always eat what's best for them. <laughs> so true. Um, I will say another thing about mushrooms, which I think a lot of people might inevitably think of, because I think a lot of when people think Vikings and they think mighty warriors or what's also called as a berserkers, um, there's a lot of ideas going around about, you know, mushrooms and getting high and fighting high, basically, um, as this sort of super warrior. Um, and I think the um, the mushroom in question would be flugsvamp, uh, which is what's toadstool. it called? In yeah, toadstool. Yeah, the big the, like red the, one. The Smurf one, mm. I want to say, yeah. And there is, I, apparently it was a historian at some point who made a suggestion that that might have been the case, that they would have gotten high on these mushrooms and then gone off to fight and uh, would have been known as these insane warriors also known as the circus then but there isn't actually any evidence for it so it's a fun thought and I think it's it is um touched on in the first um season of the Vikings of the tv show when they're in Uppsala for this huge sacrifice kind of thing they get high on mushrooms um but it's yeah, it, he kind of shut that theory down a little bit, um, yeah. which, and you know. I guess I, they even had it in, I watched the first couple of episodes of the Vinland Saga, the anime Oh, did you? I, I never got around to it. Yeah, but... I've only watched a couple of episodes. And like, overall, like I can say, I'm. They, it looks like they have made an effort to actually be somewhat historically accurate okay a lot I mean obviously it's a made-up story but it's anime right yeah exactly I feel like they've been more faithful than most western productions oh, fair that enough. in Viking things um in the Viking age uh however they do bring in there is one scene in the the last episode that I watched where they do bring out like the toadstool I'm not sure he even eats it but he's just kind of holding it and I'm like okay <laughs> And the thing I is, didn't even know it was toadstools actually until he said so. I thought it was. I don't think they use toadstools in in the in the Vikings show. I think they just use some other brown mushroom of some kind. Yeah. And the thing is, like toadstools, you're not even going to get high from if you eat them. They're, they're poisonous. Upset. Yeah. They're just gonna, they're going to give you a really upset. Stomach. Like everyone knows, you don't eat toadstools. <laughs> At least they do in Sweden. Like, because mm. because it's so hard to go out and pick mushrooms and knowing which which ones are poisonous or not like I don't I wouldn't even dream of it I would love to be the kind of person who could go out and pick mushrooms like that would totally be part of my identity I could totally see that happening 
but it, I am too is, too afraid. Of it is very the wrong ones. Like there's one kind of mushroom that I feel fairly okay with picking, but that's because I've been out with a lot of like Swedish Chant people trails. that have grown up in the forests here, and I have yeah. watched them picking it about many times. That I'm like, okay, this one I can identify. Yeah, it's the Trastkantarell. I'm not sure what we the would... yellow ones. No, I I think yeah, they're the called the yellow Chantarells. And then, uh, yeah. No, because there's can there's chanterell and the, but that is canterell and then trat canterell is something else. All so right. canter okay. can canterell, which is chanterell, is like the yeah. orange ones, like they're quite broad, orangey yellow. Yeah. And then trat canterell, it has like a yellow stem and then a brown like top that has veins underneath. You know more of mushrooms than I do, clearly. <laughs> Um, because I really like trat cantarelles I discovered I, this is so off topic and I'm so sorry but I just have to say <laughs> you get you get the basic mushrooms in the supermarket right um but I went to the supermarket uh in Malta of all places like we were there on holiday went into this amazing supermarket and I swear to god I've never seen so many mushrooms in my life like there were like a whole wall of just mushrooms and I mushrooms I've never even seen like they looked I mean there were pink mushrooms white mushrooms and I swear to god I mean all of these were safe to eat like food but it was so cool like so a lot of I'm speechless a lot of mushrooms that you can eat basically that I would have never thought of eating and I'm quite open to eating diff- new things like I'm, I am not a picky eater at all I love exploring new things but I, like I didn't even recognize them totally off topic I'm so sorry but just on the topic of mushrooms I had to mention there's a really cool supermarket in Malta or on Malta in Malta it's it's an island in Malta anyways um with a lot of mushrooms <laughs> but mushrooms saying... are good and like once you've started like branching out into like the other mushrooms that exist that are edible and not hallucinogenic <laughs> Yeah, we're not talking about any that are hallucinogenic. All are safe. We're talking about safe mushrooms. Safe for work mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like just the regular like button mushrooms that you get, like they just like so boring afterwards. They have like no flavor. Yeah. Like, oh my oh. god, I had this amazing like meal in a restaurant where they did like deep fried oyster mushroom mushrooms and uh, those were like mm. yeah. I've got to I've got to mention one other thing on the topic of mushrooms. I saw on the news recently about these like mushroom farms there was one in australia and one in denmark that were brought up as like case studies or examples but they grow out of like these plastic buckets and mm. i think the goal is to make people eat more mushrooms rather than meat for for vegans basically mm. um and like it's just a huge thing like growing mushrooms and they grow out of like on the outside they make holes in these buckets and they just grow out and i mean they're humongous like big Mush- okay let's move on I yeah, think we should move on a really easy thing to like grow at home actually uh, yeah you can get those... little like uh paper boxes or something was like grow your own mushrooms and stuff should probably try and do that safe yeah. ones <laughs> <laughs> should we anyways <laughs> this talk <laughs> this talk was really good this guy was he Swedish mm. no he was Swedish was he yeah okay. he was talking in Swedish oh yeah <laughs> of course he was I'm sorry. I actually took notes. I took loads of Me notes too. um on that on that talk because it was it was during that talk it was it was just so 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 interesting. Um but yeah. Uh moving on from that, um anything else you wanted to bring up? I'm going to say is there any highlights you want to bring up? I yeah, I would like to bring up one highlight or one um uh one lecture I went to and I think it's such a shame because I went to two of her lectures. And I went to one really good one that I really enjoyed. And then I went to a second one, which I think was just not as successful as the first one. And that's the one that you went with me on. And I think you just got the bad side of the coin or like, you know, because I think you left there kind of being like, that wasn't very informative. Like I paid Mm. for that. Am I right? Did you feel that way? Yeah. 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 And I think that's because we went to the Norse, Norse, um, Versen. What is that? Um, mythological creatures like yeah so so it was talking about like the Aesir and the Varnir gods and it was talking about giants and and uh what else did we speak about I don't remember did she she speak about elves 
Yeah, yeah, she did because she talked about the difference between what what was it, Elfar and Alfvar. Yeah, or, and right. there's the, I think it's specific also to Swedish because the two words, Elva and Elf, they're so, um, there's they're so similar. Um, there's actually like you've got the sort of Tolkien elf kind of thing, and then you've got the sort of um, fairy elf kind of thing. And in Swedish, the two words fairy and elf are super similar. And it's actually quite hard telling them apart um, from a sort of folklorish folklorist point of view. Uh, so she spoke about a bit about that. But I, the thing is, I went to uh, a lecture she had two days earlier and uh, she spoke about trolls and she spoke about um, like gnomes and and how gnomes and what in Swedish we call them tomtar but tomte is also the word for Father Christmas or Santa Claus so there's kind of like a again a crossover of mythological creatures in, in that sense um, and and she spoke about these these I guess mythological creatures that are so um, interesting from uh, a, I think a Swedes perspective but also she spoke about it from a perspective of children's literature and how um Astrid Lindgren who we've mentioned on this in our first episode I think um who's the author of like Pippi Longstocking but also of uh, Ronja Rövdotter which is a book in which Kulning appears which we spoke about in episode two uh, episode one sorry and it was just so interesting how she tied that in and how the effects of literature what the effect of literature has had on our beliefs but also in how our beliefs have had uh, an effect on literature and the way that's then incorporated it was just it, it, that was a much more interesting lecture and I think that's because I went into that lecture with less knowledge but a lot mm. of interest whereas for the one we went to because it was so Viking related we felt like we already knew all of that stuff to be honest am I right yeah. I don't yeah. think it was even that it was Viking related it was just such kind of like I feel like she was trying to be comprehensive and I felt like she knew a lot but because she was trying it's to be comprehensive wide... she didn't have time to go in in depth into anything really it wasn't even an hour it was 45 minutes yeah like, which I mean I felt, time. Su- felt super sad for her that like she has to be forced to keep things so restricted it's like she felt stressed as yeah. well because she wanted to talk about so many things and then she was gonna have time for questions and it was it's a shame because I, I think she hosted like four four different uh mm-hmm. talks during that week I think she did one on um, sea monsters as well and then I think she did one more and I couldn't go to those mm-hmm. um so that was just a shame I, f- I feel like she had a lot to say and she has two books actually and I got one of them I got it signed there there were a lot of things I didn't have time to go to. I, I would have wanted to see uh, Tommy Kusela's um, lecture. Um, he's a colleague of of Tora Val. Tora Val is the is the person who held the lectures I just spoke about. She's a folklorist, but Tommy Kusela is a um, professor in in historical religion or or his religious history or whatever, and he is one of the co-hosts of the podcast um, Blant Tomter och Troll, which I really recommend and I will link that down below but um I couldn't I didn't get a chance to go see that because I wasn't there long enough so there's a great schedule for this festival or this event but you can't go to everything yeah unfortunately I'm just wondering if like quickly if we backtrack a little bit maybe you want to Mm. explain what the Swedish L actually is for people that aren't Swedish because that's not really in common Ooh. knowledge because there's similarities <laughs> with I was making comparisons to the Irish um uh Irish, uh but it's not mm. exactly the same thing so I was so the way I see it and I will it's I'm very um it is the way I see it because no one has the answer and I am not a folklorist or anything. She obviously has a, but she left it sort of open-ended. So it's it's the way you interpret it. But an elf, uh, which like elf, yeah, it, it's, <laughs> but it's so difficult. because That is basically Tolkien, which um, I would describe as like humans. They look like humans with pointy ears, but they're better than us at everything. And they're super pretty. And 
very often, I think they're depicted um, as these fair, very light creatures. And the thing is, we, I think we call them elva. Like, even though they're called elf in English, our translation, I think, is elva. But if we actually look at what an elva is mythologically, or, or as, a, as a mythological creature, an elva is a fairy. Like, like a small creature with wings flying around. I would literally translate elva to fairy. But then you've got, in English, you've got fae, which is a play on fairy. And if you've read stuff like Sarah J. Maas, like fantasy stuff, fae basically means elf, right? It's the same kind of thing. Yeah. So I, it's like all these crossover words that play on each other and it's, it gets confusing. So in I Swedish, can, be, yeah. Yeah, I can take it further back because I don't, or, I was just wondering yeah. what the... If we take it further back, like, so we go from, like, the fairy and the fae um, in ancient uh, historical Ireland, like in a lot of Irish mythology, yeah. there is um, this people called the Tuatha de Danann, and they are the people that existed in Ireland before the Celts. And it is sure. mentioned in the sagas that when the Celts arrived, these people were forced to live underground and they became okay. the Aishi, um, which are people who are living in hills and they are considered d descended from gods so Tuatha Dé Danann that she means like the tribe of the gods and mm -hmm. they're those people when they're talked about in sagas they are talked about as being the people who are the best at everything they are the best at and I art, actually the best yeah. at music and these and the theory is that it is from these that over time they became the they moved from being this Aishi that was this godly race into being fairies and I actually think that's where Sarah J. Maas, just because I mentioned her, I think that's where she's gotten her, her um, um, inspiration from. Because I think she might even use that word somewhere in one of her books at some point. And I think her stuff is um, based off Celtic mythology, vaguely. Uh, I'm thinking about um, A Court of Thorns and Roses as opposed mm -hmm. to Throne of Glass. Um if you look at her use of names and stuff as well. And it's, it's quite interesting because one of my C pieces it writes Celtic fantasy. So it's it, this is all super interesting. But I've got to correct myself before I forget because we have the word alf in Swedish. And I think actually elf translates to alf, which is super close to elva because the letter e is an a, like an alf, but with two dots. And then f and v can very easily be mixed up. So visually these words look a lot like each other and also um or audibly or, or like or, or yeah, orally they sound like, the same <laughs> they sound, i don't know words <laughs> they um, make sounds that your ears recognize as being similar to yeah so that they're, they're super connected and, and i'm wondering whether they might actually come from the original same sort of idea because in norse mythology you also have these alf but they are connected to this which is it's just there's just so much I, I we would need a whole episode on this and we are not even experts like this is just from an yeah. interest in and in reading <laughs> and general understanding of stuff so it's um but I I if you know Swedish or if you are Swedish I I recommend uh and uh or Troll because they do have very good podcasts on Swedish mythological creatures but I don't know if they've done an episode on elves okay shall we move on <laughs> yeah let's talk a little bit about music because we there, it's not yes. only lectures so there is music also so I went mm -hmm. to three performances I oh, don't did you wow yeah no I only went to one yeah so we went to the same one that was super fun um if we move away from uh, <laughs> how do we paint the scene of this so imagine like like an arena that kind of looks like I, the only thing I can compare it to is when I've seen American TV shows and they have like football stands <laughs> and the arena's kind of built like mm -hmm. that. But if, have you seen that? Have you seen that night film with Heath Ledger? A, mean, night, a, nice, a night, a night's tale. You mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, when they have like the a tournament and they, you know, basically your, your normal night tournament, medieval tournament. It's that kind of arena, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I think so, they yeah, actually like have the, this kind of performance. That's what. Yeah, it's, they that's did why do they have joust, that. They did do jousting, jousting there. You. Just we didn't. It's see like it. a, yeah, we didn't go to that. But 
the concert was also held at this arena. Yeah. And then so um, the ground is like just dirt underneath yeah. it. So the band we went to see was Konix. I, yeah. I think that's how you pronounce it. I might be Konix, wrong. Konix, Konix. Yeah, it's a Swiss. Mm. Sw- do we want to say Swiss punk? Swiss. Uh, I want to say medieval punk or medieval rock. Yeah, it, it's kind of hard to put a finger on it. It's it's basically like if I'm going to create an analogy of the style, think about like your the sort of energy that you get from music, like at a rave or in a club, but just with a medieval twist on it. Yeah. <laughs> so it so was, there is like yeah, medieval party music, medieval yeah. inspired party music because it was not uh... <laughs> very hyped up medieval. Yeah, music with, with some doing... electronic aspects but yeah, I wouldn't with I would a not lot call of it fire breathing and there was a lot of like um dancers doing a very good performance a very good visual performance because the music is the music is quite repetitive when you say yeah definitely. it's like the same the same kind of like however many bars of music over and over again and there's not a lot of singing there was some singing but not a lot of it and it's quite high energy and uh the pacing or can you say pacing in music like um it's just very very hype that's that's how i would ex- describe it but they did have a team of of dancers um who performed with very exciting costumes mm-hmm. and masks and stuff and they had a fire breather um yeah and yeah. they were very good at like encouraging the crowd to be yeah. active also like at the beginning they were like you do know you're at a Konix performance right you're not going to want to sit on the benches <laughs> and just like and we went down and danced like I say yeah. not even for like half a song and I'm like okay I'm gonna go down and dance um we were literally just barefoot dancing so we we're like it's not gonna work we, we were just like let's just take off the sh- any shoes that we have and we we're just sort of running yeah. around this <laughs> it was it was really fun it was good atmosphere everyone was like dressed in medieval or viking clothes Mm. Uh, and there were kids there loads of kids and this was quite not late but when did it start eight eight. or seven thirty or something and there were kids dancing and they had these huge like um not headphones but like what you call them earmuffs Mm. like to block out the sound because it was it was quite loud um and they were running around having and it wasn't a big audience no. I don't know. I can't estimate how many, but you know, it wasn't like being yeah, like the, the arena where it was maybe like a third full or yeah. A, yeah, yeah, and like, but the thing is, even though it was a small audience, like the energy was enough that it like it felt like it could have been more. It did, yeah. It did not feel like it was a a not successful crowd. If you see, do you know what I mean? Mm. Like it was a very energetic Definitely. crowd, so it was totally worth it. But mm. it was a lot of drums, bagpipes, flutes. I don't know what else like yeah a lot of bagpipes I would say but it, it was it was really good and and they the they were good hosts I would say of the concert as in the the band themselves speaking Definitely. to the audience and it was just uh, a very good a very good show I had a lot of fun and I'd never heard their music before so mm-hmm. so that was a, a really successful thing but you went to to other performances so go mm-hmm. ahead and tell us about yeah. that I think the main one I want to bring up was because this felt like another like zone of experience and how I'm going to introduce this is that you have not lived until you have seen um, a good medieval Christian woman in a wimple head banging with a cup of beer in her hand (laughs) in a dank cellar. (laughs) I'm kind of sorry I missed that. Yeah, that was uh, that sounded a lot more fun in my head than when it came out but (laughs) so basically I went to I was recommended this band by someone else and this was so there's again there's some ticketed performances and then there's some performances that just happen in like the pubs in the town so there's a lot of like a few like old tavern medieval tavern style um bars and one of them every evening has like a series of performances and these are people who do have ticketed performances earlier on in the day but then they come and perform unticketed later on in the evening and I I'm pretty I kind of wish I'd seen this band at one of their ticketed performances because I felt like it would have been a very different atmosphere so I could compare the two Mm -hmm. because 
just like my god the energy was insane here like so we went in and there was this massive queue all the way around the tavern like to come into like the there was like this small underground space like you had to go down some stairs that was like the inside of the bar and it it was pretty small like I'm gonna say maybe like five meters across like in front of the stage something like that Mm -hmm. maybe a little maybe no more than five meters 10 meters maybe I'm suck at estimating sizes but not very big and it was just filled like crushed with like people (laughs) and like people were screaming and so energetic before the band even came out and oh wow they had tracks that I've looked them up afterwards so the band was Vox Vulgaris and I've looked up there I've heard of them I uh, I looked up the Spotify list of tracks on Spotify afterwards and like they were playing some things that are not on their like regular okay. track lists but obviously it was stuff that people knew because people were singing along <laughs> to it like without oh, even, wow. like so they started off like this is where it was such like an interesting hybrid of things because it was like they they were like really like heavily rocking out with medieval like instruments so bagpipes horns uh drums and like singing like in latin over the top but like the energy was a rock concert so like they were singing ave maria but everyone was like ave maria (laughs) it sounds amazing (laughs) it was like it was really fascinating to watch like I didn't feel like quite into it as most of the crowd was because I'm not as familiar with their music Uh but it was just this ultra level of like only in this specific context could this amount of like nerdiness happen over this sort of music in this sort of space it was like I felt like I I I, I was just so intrigued by the behavior (laughs) that happened um do you have anything else to add to the medieval week then because I feel like I have mentioned everything I have one thing that I would like of the medieval week for the future that's a good point I would have I read about there being more like a a book festival within the festival like festivals within the festival and uh, I got the feeling that there would be then book stalls like quite a lot of books because I mean there's a lot of historical fiction out there and the theme was fantasy so I mean come on like they could have done so much with that but there wasn't not the way they hyped it up to be so and especially for someone who reads a lot this would have been huge like there was a stall from the bookshop in this the uh, like a uh, not the traditional like book chain bookshop but like Mm -hmm quite a good bookshop in in Bisbee and and they sold books from the speakers because I went to see a, another historical historian speak about uh, a Viking city um, and he, his book was there and then Tura Val's book was there and those so that was good and then they had some of the RPG books there but then that was kind of it so that was a, a little bit of a letdown but I will say that I did stumble upon the stall Uh, which was not in the same place as the other book stalls, which was a shame because it would have added more to the sort of book festival idea or feeling. But this was quite interesting, which I really liked. There were two, I don't want to say hybrid authors or indie authors, because I think they're just published by really small publishers. They're Swedish, uh, Swedish authors who, on their own initiative, stood there selling their books along with two other authors so I think there were books by a uh, a total of four authors but only two of them stood there sort of thing and they represented all four of them and they had different publishers uh, but they're all small publishers and I've I've not seen any of their books in um, traditional bookstores I have seen some of their books in the sci-fi bookshop in Gamla Stan the sci-fi bookshop is my favorite bookshop I think it might even be your yeah, favorite bookshop absolutely it's a it's a bookshop in there are three of them in Sweden but they specialize in fantasy science fiction and horror and I will say that the majority of it would be fantasy they also have a second floor with role-playing games and merchandise like they are it's a it's, really it's, big store. and you oh and they have loads of anime as well and manga stuff so you go in there and you're just surrounded by like-minded people and it's fantastic um 
but I've seen their stuff there because I think they take in some um, books that are less known within the fantasy genre and they take in more Swedish fantasy, which you might not find in other in other bookstores because they're not bestsellers. Mm. Um, and it was really, I actually bought two of the books. The book, the first book in, because the two authors that they represented that weren't there, I'd read both of their books. But the two authors that were there um I had not read their books I didn't know of them and so I bought the first book in their series um and I thought that was just such a nice um aspect of it and I wish they would have been stood or that they had gotten a place closer to the other bookstores so you would have gotten that sort of more complete feeling so I think they could have planned that be that better when they knew another bookstall of small, uh, not very well-known authors were going to come to the festival. Yeah. Um, I thought that was a very interesting aspect of it. And it makes, it, I, I spoke about this with you. I would want to be there with my book yeah. one day because it's the best. It's the best um, audience, <laughs> right? Fantasy. Like, you know, so um, especially if you write fantasy set in like the Viking <laughs> period or medieval period, it was just such a, um, you know, so I just think they could have, if they were going to do a book festival within the festival, they could have really gotten, like, why wasn't the sci-fi bookshop there with their own exactly. stuff? Exactly. And I feel like there was much more potential to create, like, a proper little corner, and you, there could have been more, like, little spontaneous talks and readings yeah. going on. It didn't need to just be Swedish authors either. Like, no, I mean, the Medieval oh Week, it has such an international pull to A it. lot of people come in that come there that aren't even Swedish or Scandinavian yeah. even. So external um, authors. And I can imagine, like, like, if people knew about, like, oh, if people just thought about it, they'd be like, oh, yeah, this will be a great opportunity to come with my book. Um, yeah. Because so. this book festival aspect, that was nowhere on the website. I read this in... And so in, in a interview in a tourist magazine on the ship, on, on the ferry to go to, to Gotland. So this was not advertised at all. And in Sweden, I think there is even a, fest, uh, a fantasy book fair at some point. Is that? In, in, yeah, I, I think so, actually. A lot of indie authors go there, I think. Um, so I think that they could have attracted so many people. It would have been amazing, especially for someone who reads. And I think a lot of people there do actually read mm. there are a lot of rpg like players there and there's a lot of historical reenactors and it, it they could have really gotten a, you know as a writer as a reader i think that would have been a, a very positive um improvement or mm. you know um area of improvement that could have been could be addressed yeah what about you anything that you would have liked to see more of I think like that you, your biggest point is also one of my biggest points. Yeah. So I mean, overall, like, except for seeing that bit of potential, I mean, I went with the goal of like, I want to, I have, I want to make new clothes. I have specific yeah, fabrics that I'm looking for and I've been yeah. really struggling to find them. I found everything I needed. We we went to fabric store. hunting. <laughs> yeah. That one stall that we then bumped into at another fair. We love you and we think you're amazing um she had such good fabrics yeah. yeah and we kept recommending people to go back there so I think we yeah. had at least sold yeah. all of her fabrics for her <laughs> yeah I bought two fabrics from there I thought she was fantastic yeah. and such a friendly face but mm -hmm. um should we in that case should we bring it to a close I have one recommendation mm -hmm. I want to do uh did you have a recommendation I don't have anything right now I think I've thrown in so many stuff but would you festival. That. You did you did mention the Vinland, the, the anime. I don't think I've watched enough of it yet to okay. know if I'd recommend okay. it or not. Okay, fair enough. I mean, fair I've enough. watched like two episodes and animes okay. are like 20 minutes per episode. So it's... Fair enough. Yeah. I do have a recommendation then. Um, and I've got it right here with me. This book is a Norwegian fantasy, which is translated into Swedish, but it's also translated into English. I only recommend stuff that you can watch or read in English. Um, and I, the thing I find really interesting in here, I would say it's a portal fantasy, kind of, 
but uh, in this society, people have tails. Like they're like humans, pretty much, but they have tails. And the main character doesn't. So she's an, a bit of an outcast. Um, and it's just, it, it, it's so cool. Like it's actually just so cool. It's called Udinspan um, in Swedish. I don't know the Norwegian original title, but it's basically translates to Odin's child. And I've looked it up. The English version is called Odin's child. Uh, I've even got the rest of the books in the trilogy, but I've not gotten around to reading them. Um, and I think the series is called The Raven Rings, if I translate the Swedish title, but I don't know what the official title is. Um, but it is very, very good. Like, it's very good. I, I don't know how else to describe it. There are a lot of ravens. There is portal magic and a whole society where everyone has tails. And it sounds maybe odd or just like, uh, but that's just like, that's fantasy, you know, but it's just very interesting how their mindset around it becomes when this main character doesn't. So, and I think there's some healing in there, like herbal healing magic as well, uh, or medicine. So um, totally recommend that. I like recommending not the bestsellers. I think last time I re recommended a Swedish Finnish uh, or finish Swedish fantasy because it's just like it's underrated that's what I want to say mm. it's underrated and people don't know about it but it's available for you to read in English and it's super super good so yeah I am going to be a let down and say that I have not written a response to your little flash fiction uh, I was going to do it this morning mm. uh, and I just got distracted by other stuff exciting stuff that it's just so it's um I can't continue the story, but I I will genuinely write a continuation to your story for the next episode. I promise. Absolutely. We look forward to hearing it. I don't have a choice now, do I? Exactly. It's got to be extra good now. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I've set the bar this high. No, but if you missed, uh, do you want to, do you just want to say what you did last episode, Lizzie? Yes. Yeah, in so case people missed it. So at the end of the last episode, I introduced, I read out a short passage of text that I started from a story. It was literally didn't put too much thought into it. So don't feel pressured. Um, and just basically, I read out a bit of a story that I then ended on a bit of a cliffhanger and then left over for Vandela to continue. So and the I idea didn't. is that we <laughs> alternate and add a bit of passage and build up a longer story over time. Yeah. And you can, I mean, the best thing would go to go would be to go listen to episode two and listen through the whole episode. You don't have to until you get to the end where Lizzie does read read this out to you. Uh, but it's also in the show notes for episode two if you really cannot stand listening to our voices for an hour and a half because yeah. um, it's it's very good. I I was hooked and I did not know this was coming. Um, and um, yeah, so I will I will write something until the next episode. Amazing. So with that, we'll say thank you for listening for today. And we look forward to you tuning in next time. Badum. All right.